All right, let's get started. So how many people are done uh, with the memory rearrangement assignment, P3B? So like one person, who's done with the first part where you just have to, oh, you're done with the first part where you just have to move the code. So okay, so I'm gonna give a couple brief hints on that, so hopefully you're working on that. Uh, but most of today is just, uh, I'm gonna show you how to do um, some coding in Linux, in the Linux source code, and uh, that won't really help you do any project or to get a better grade or anything, but hopefully it's kind of fun and will be useful to you someday. So, but first let's talk about P3B. A lot of people are coming to me and asking me kind of how to debug this because it's kind of hard to see the output, but let's just, when you're first booting up, <coughs> uh, the first two programs you execute are the net program and the shell program. So kind of the flow looks something like this. Uh, you're first going to be executing exec uh, for a net, and then that's going to be running, and then you're going to fork, and this is for, uh, oops, this is for the shell, and then exec again, and then that runs. Okay, so there are several places where you should, like, if you're, if you're having problems, you should try to figure out where through this flow you're first having problems, right? So the first thing I would be doing is in, uh, in exec, I would be making sure that this actually returns uh, success at the end, right? So that's the very first step. Then after that, the next thing I would do is I would be seeing if my init C program is already running. And that could be a little bit tricky because depending on the type of mistake you make, uh, it's possible that it will actually be running the code, but maybe memory isn't aligned or uh, uh, you might have, like, basically what, what can happen is you can, it could be running and you can call printf, but memory is not where you think it is, so now that address is garbage. So uh, you could say, uh, well, let me, let me just uh, bring up the net program quick. So, right, so this is, this is doing some initial setup and... So I mean, if you're trying to see if that's running, you might try adding something here. Let's just say hello. Hmm. So, so, oh, uh, no X. So basically, no. Um, X11, so I'm just saying like run it in the terminal without that separate window. Um, so, yeah, so I'm doing that, and, and you see now that I have my hello up here. Uh, so, I mean, that would be a natural way to debug, but let me just SSH in here again quick so I can kill that. Uh, yeah, so with the NOX thing, it's, it's actually kind of a pain because you can't exit it then. You have to actually kill it from another, uh, another terminal. So, okay, so I killed that. So, but, but like a lot of people, bugs that people have been showing me, uh, they, this is running, but they never did that. So the way to kind of tell if it is running is as the very first thing, just do an exit. And let me, I'll run that again, actually. Okay, do you see that when it starts up, you get uh, a panic because a net is exiting. Uh, so if you aren't getting any output from a net, but you think it might be running anyway, that would be a good thing to check. So, okay, so let's go back to our flow. Right, so the first thing you should do is check that this starts success. Next, uh, in the net, you should check that it's actually um, actually running. Uh, if, if it's running but you aren't getting any output, you need to think about where exactly you're placing memory. Uh, then after that, uh, if it kind of crashes after and it starts running but before you get a shell, then there's probably a problem with your fork, right? Because exec already worked at least once. Uh, so if the shell doesn't start, there's probably a problem with fork. So that's uh, the fork. What? How does that create a new address space? Have you guys found a function for that? What is that function? Yeah. Copy UVM, right? So that's uh, under kernel uh, VM. Right, so fork ultimately calls this. And this is tapping a new address space. And if you're having a bug, like, so you can try to look at this and see what it's doing, right? So first it gets a new, new address space, and then it's uh, looping from zero to size. And size was the previous boundary of the address space, right? So previously, everything between zero and size was valid. Uh, that's not true anymore. So if you have a bug, there's a good chance it's because, uh, say, you are copying everything over that you should be for the shell. So you kind of only have like part of the address space. Or maybe you're copying things <coughs> that aren't valid, right? Uh, before we kind of, uh, everything was valid, so this is just a simple loop. 
But now you have a hole in your address space, so you have to make sure you don't copy that. Copy that too. So, um, so those are most of my hints. I guess the other hint is, uh, who has gotten the stack resizing working at all yet? So yeah, a couple people. So for the heap, I mean, if you look at the heap for inspiration, like you'll probably get a little bit confused because the heap, uh, there's an actual system called SBRK where you can explicitly say, I want more heap space now, right? I mean, when you're writing your C, C programs, you never have to call something like that to grow your stack, right? I mean, you've never, I mean, you, you've written a lot of programs that grow the stack, but you've never had to do that. So what you're going to have to do is that when the stack is growing, it's going to grow into regions that uh, where there hasn't been a mapping in the page table yet. And what you have to do is you have to catch that, and instead of killing the process, at that point you have to quick install a page table entry so that it can then uh, retry, right? So you kind of let it page fault, and then you give it more memory, and then let it keep running, right? So kind of what, what to do is I first would, if I was testing this myself, I would just write a program that kind of does uh, kind of a stack overflow, right? That just keeps growing. And so then, then you'll see in your code when it panics, you'll see that place where it's panicking, that's probably where instead of panicking, you should be giving it more memory so it has a place to go. So any questions on that so far before we dive into the Linux stuff? Okay, so yeah. Uh huh. So you're, are, are you confused on how to give it more memory or how to detect when you're supposed to give it more memory? Um, how to actually give it more memory. So, uh, so for that part at least you can probably get inspired by the heap growth. Yeah. Right, so uh, I forget what, what it's called. Um, so yeah, so there's this k-alloc which is kind of uh, just a place where you grab new pages. Right, so I think you could get another page from that and then just like map it in, right? So I mean, uh, I think the SBRK will probably, I'm not sure exactly where that code is right now. I guess I could look at it um, and see if I can quickly give some advice. So this is grow process. I think that is in bm.c, maybe. Oh. Nope, so maybe that's under process. So this is basically allocating more memory, right? So this is trying to be probably calling that other alloc function I was talking about. Um, so you're going to have to kind of like do something similar to grow process, but you have to do that not on a system call, but when there's a page fault. So, yeah. Any other quick questions before we go on to the Linux stuff? Okay, so... Let's head over to Linux. And we're going to do three things today. First, I'm going to show you how you can not open up a file, but actually open up a raw, raw disk and read from that. And that's pretty useful if you want to, say, write a, a disk benchmark. Uh, next thing I'm going to show you how to do is how to write a Linux module. So it's pretty slow and painful to compile the whole Linux kernel and reboot and all that. Uh, but it's actually kind of cool. You can compile what's called a loadable module and you can basically add code to Linux without restarting Linux. Right? So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty uh, fast way to do things. And then like the third part is I'm going to show you how to make your own I.O. scheduler. So I think today we're just going to do C-scan, but you could do anything. And that is in a loadable module, so that's why I'm showing you how to do loadable modules first. So hopefully that will be interesting. Uh, but first let's look at how we might actually uh, benchmark a desk. So I, is, this, is this too small? Probably, right? Is that a good size? The thumbs up isn't bigger? Or? Okay, it's good. Okay, good. Oh, cool. Okay, so uh, the first thing to talk about is that any sort of like file system, it's mounted on a, a dev device. So kind of like everything in, in Linux is, is just like a file, right? So kind of even like your disk is kind of viewed just as a file, even though it's not. Uh, so you can see here that my root file system is mounted on this slash dev SDA, 
So let me look at what else I have under slash dev uh, SD. So this SD is just like for SATA disk. So you see that I have three disks here in my virtual machine. And then this SDA1, SDA2, and so forth. That's just different partitions on that disk. So I'm going to be doing a bunch of experiments on this disk here. And if I want, I can just open that directly. I, I, I just open the path dev uh, SDC, and then I can read and write to that disk. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so let's start with, I didn't add much code in here, so hopefully that's a good thing. So that doesn't seem like we're going too fast. Uh, so what we want is we just want to open that. Oops. Okay, and we're just trying to do o, o read only for now so that we don't actually <coughs> uh, corrupt anything on there. And let me assert that that actually worked. Okay, so let's try this. Actually, let me fix my make file so I actually uh, can just type make. Oh. Okay. Oops, and it's not happy because I need to return something. So what's going to happen when I run this? Does anybody think this will work? So it's going to complain, and the reason why it's going to complain is, well, actually, let me, I'll just, uh, we should find out uh, the way you should normally find out. I can print any message here for my PR and run that again, and it's basically saying permission denied. Why, why is it giving me a permission deny here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're doing something pretty dangerous, right? I mean, if anybody can just open up the disk and read and write anything, well, then they could read anybody's data or corrupt anything they want. So how do I fix that? Like everything else in Linux, I just do sudo. Okay, and great, that works. So I was able to open it. Okay, so we have an open disk. Okay, and what is the next thing we want to do? So let's, let's now that we have our open disk, Let's figure out how big it is. People <coughs> often will figure out how large a file or a disk is with this system call called lseek. So, so, I mean, normally when you call read or write, that kind of just reads or writes the next offset in the file. You can change what the next offset in the file is with this lseek call. And you see it takes three arguments. It's saying what is a file descriptor, and then the offset, and then this whence kind of tells you how to interpret the offset. So if I, there's, there's three different Things I could say for whence, I could say seek set, seek cur, seek n. So seek set would just be saying, I'm kind of setting it in absolute term. So if I say 100, that's like 100 from uh, the start of the file. Seek end means I'm kind of doing it relative to the end. So I could say seek end, and then my offset might be negative 100, and then I would be 100 bytes right before the end of the file. And this is just relative, seek cur is relative to the current position. So the way people will often, you often see this code in Linux, is that they'll get the size like this, they'll just say lseek. And so lseek, in addition to actually moving the offset, it returns what the offset is. So I want to seek to, uh, well, I want to do it on that file descriptor, and I want to do it zero, and I want to do it seek end, right? So this is going to return the absolute file descriptor after seeking zero bytes before the end. So this will just give me the disk size, and let me print what that is. Oh no. Oh, I need to sudo again. All right, so we get this, which is uh, about 16 uh, is about 16 gigabytes, which is what I intended. Um, so that's so good so far. So then, so we're, we're building a benchmark, right? So we should do some I.O. for a while. A nice way to do a benchmark is just uh, you do as much I.O. as you can in a given amount of time. That way, if you end up on a really slow device, you don't have to run your benchmark forever. Uh, so what we're going to do is we can get the current time of day with the get current get, get time of day call. Uh, so let me see here. I should I need to bring up the man page for that. Okay, so we can get the time of day in these time val structs. So let me grab a couple of those. So I'm gonna, I need to know what the current time is and also the end time. And uh, basically, what we're going to do here is we're going to have a while loop that does some I/O. Okay, but first we need to figure out how long to run that while loop. 
Uh, so we can just do get time of day, and we'll do um, both now and end. And then for the end, so that this, this structure, if we look in the man page, we see it has both like the seconds and the microseconds. So I'm just going to, uh, oops, I'm just going to increase that by, by say three, so we run for three seconds. Okay, and we want to run while, oh, we want to run while uh, the current time is not past the end time. So we could say, well, now dot tv sec is less than n dot tv sec. Or we will also want to consider the, the microseconds, right? So I'm going to also consider the second case, which I can say, what if these are equal? and uh, the, the microseconds is less. Okay, so we can do I.O. So actually, let's, uh, oh, the other thing I need to do is I need to make sure I keep checking what the current time is, otherwise this will run forever. So let's run this. Uh-oh. Oh yeah, so the skip time of day, um, I should have showed you in the man page, but basically you can specify a time zone to it. Uh, we don't care about that, so I'm just going to pass null. Okay, and we can run that, and that runs for a while. Uh, I'm actually just going to time it, so we can see it's actually the three seconds. Okay, great, so, so far so good. Um, so the next thing we want to do is, let's make a random workload that we just read randomly from the desk. Okay, so... Uh, what do we want to do here? So let's just read a random block each time. So I'm just trying to, I mean, there's, there's functions you could use to get this, but I'm just trying to say, define the block size. It's 40.96. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, well, what we want to do here is, First, so first, like what we have to, something we have to be careful for is that our random number can actually generate a big enough random number, right? Because we have a pretty big disk, we need to make sure that's in range. So let me first, so we already got the disk size here. Let me assert that rand max is greater than or equal to the disk size, right? Otherwise, we're going to run into a problem, right? I run. And actually, it's not, right? So this is the biggest random number we can generate. Not surprising, that's the biggest, uh, what is it? That's two gigabytes, right? So I mean, that's like the biggest you can get uh, for a signed integer, right? So this is not going to work for us. Um, what we want to do instead is we're going to have to, uh, one way we can do around this, well, we could call rand twice, <clears throat> but a more elegant thing we can do is we can just uh, generate a random block number instead of a random uh, offset, right? So then, so let me, let me do that. I'm going to say total blocks equals disk size over block size and then what I want to do is I just want to make sure I can make sure that's big enough okay and that's fine okay so now I'm good so I can uh, I should be able to generate a random block number and then go from there okay so I'll do that here now so I'll say the block equals rand, and I need to mod that by the total number of blocks. Okay, and I should also do an s rand while I'm at it, and I can just take time null for that. Okay, so now I can have a random block number. Let me make sure that this is actually working. So. Whoops. Did I forget to include time? Apparently, I thought I had all of these. So I make that, and then let's run it. And sure enough, those look like random block numbers. <clears throat> so now let's actually uh, do some reads. Uh, 
So what I want to do here is I'm going to read from the file descriptor. Actually, how many people have seen this pread call before? Instead of having to seek each time, you can do a positional read. So this is just like a normal read, but you see that we also have this offset argument here at the end. Right, so this prevents us from having to seek all, the, all, all over the place. So I'm going to read to a buffer, and uh, that's going to be, uh, what did I have before? That's the block size. Okay, and what offset do I want to do? I want to be, have the block times the block size. Okay, so I should also define this buffer while I'm at it. Okay, and also I'm going to get what my return value is. Oops. And I'm going to assert that that is actually I'm reading the whole thing, right? So I mean this is kind of bad code because I mean technically Linux could choose to read less than that and I should handle that, but um, I'm not going to do that for now. Okay, so now we should be re reading some random I.O., um, which is good. And let me just run this to make sure this works, but then we actually have to count how much I.O. we actually get. Mm. Uh oh. Oh, pseudo again. Dang it. Um, okay, so that is appearing to work. <coughs> so, what we need to do now is we have to actually figure out the rate at which we're doing IO. So, I'm just going to have a, a variable for total IO. And uh, so, I've asserted this, so I can just say plus equals the return value size. And then when it's all done, well, let me actually, let's, let's figure out how long we actually want to run. So we'll say seconds, and we'll say we'll run for five seconds. And, well, actually, we're, well, that's fine. Okay. So we're counting how much I.O. we're doing. And now when we're all done, we can just print off how much it is, or the rate at which it is. So the rate equals percent LD, oops. LD, and then we want bytes per second. Mm, and that is IO over, uh, what, how did I, what did I say before? Sec, okay. Okay, so let's run this. This is running for, run for five seconds. I mean, the longer, the longer it runs, the less noisy my data will be, right? So, I mean, we see this is, this is pretty slow, right? We're getting only 324 kilobytes per second. Mm. What kind of workload wipe might we uh, do to get a faster throughput? Sequential, Sequential right? So let's, let's try that instead. And this time, so I'm still going to read from a random location. In general, like, it's, it's useful to make sure that if there's some cache somewhere in the system, that if you're running your benchmark, you are hitting that, right? So that's why I'm kind of doing it a random location each time so that we don't ever read from the cache and then it looks like we're super fast. Uh, so what am I going to do here? I'm going to just say do that once and then when I'm going to down here I'm actually going to say plus equals, well actually no, I'll say it equals block plus one and then I want to take modulo total blocks. Right, so let's try that. So that should be a lot faster. And it is, right? Unsurprisingly. So bytes, kilobytes, megabytes. And if I was running on raw disk, that'd probably actually be a lot faster too. So I'm, I'm running in virtual box right now, so there's probably quite a bit of overhead. Uh, so I would expect my disk is probably at least twice that fast. But mm. So you can't take these numbers perfectly, but you can probably see that the random I.O. is a lot slower, right? So here, here's an interesting thing now. What if we're doing random I.O., but instead of having, right now we only have, ever have one random I.O. outstanding at a time, what if we had many random I.O.s outstanding at a time, right? Like, would that be faster or slower or the same? Why? Faster, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. If we keep many out requests outstanding at the same time, the disk has a lot of decisions and it can choose an optimal pattern. So I'm going to hop over to... Uh, I forget what my other file was called. Oh, main threads. I'm going to write this to, I'll write just this main two. 
So basically, what is this program doing? Uh, so th this is just kind of some generic code for a set of worker threads. Uh, basically, I'm doing a bunch of creates and then a bunch of joins. And afterwards, I can check some, some data, right? So I don't actually have to worry about locking or anything. And then let me just run this so you can see what exactly we're doing. Oh. Uh. Uh. I'll just do that for now. Oh, and I actually need the p threads, right? Okay, so that prints 10 hellos. So basically what I want to do now is I'm going to take... So before we just had all this happening in one big function, I'm going to take this from main and put it over in the worker so we can have 10 different threads doing this at the same time. Okay. I'm going to grab that, and now I'm going to go over to main2, and that's what workers are going to be doing. They're just going to be doing what we did in main before, and also I think I have to, I have to grab these extra defines that I had before, right? Okay, so now we've just moved to a concurrent version of the program, and what else do we need to do here? Okay, let's just, let's just run this first of all. Oops. Ah. Okay, so uh, we can't really see like how it's changed, but uh, let's. So now that we see that it's kind of working. Um, you see that I created the worker struct for each of them, and that's getting passed. Here is this arg. I don't think I actually grabbed it anywhere. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say. Uh, I want to get my uh, a pointer to my own own worker, so I'll say this me equals arg. Okay, and then I can add a field up here. I'll say long io. And here I'm just going to say now that io equals zero, and instead of having that local variable, right? So now now in this array of structures. Each of the threads is going to be track, keeping track of how much IO it does, which means in the main thread, after I join everybody, I can check how much IO they did all together. So that's what I'm going to do now. Long tote equals zero. And then, so, I mean, once they've joined, I know nobody else is accessing that, so I don't have to worry about locks at all. But basically what I want to do is I want to say workers... So for each worker, I want to get their IO, okay? And then I'm going to print off like a total rate. Okay? Oh no. Oh, and that's because I, I, I got rid of that local variable and have it just in the struct now. Okay? Well, pseudo. Okay, so now we see we're actually up to bytes, kilobytes. Oh, well that's, okay, so it's a little bit faster. Let me go back to the random again, because I meant to have it be random each time. So it's still on doing it sequentially. So that's what I want. I don't need this anymore. Oh. Okay, so that's a bit faster, right? So that's bytes, kilobytes. That's 424 kilobytes. Whereas let's say we had had fewer threads. What was it before when it was just one? Okay, so we see that this is significantly faster, right? How much faster is that? I may divide that time uh, by this. So... Okay, so if, if I go from one thread to ten threads, I mean, I can't go ten times faster because I only still have one disk head, but I can get thirty times, thirty percent, thirty percent faster because the disk now has a lot more flexibility, right? So it makes sense. Any questions so far before we uh, jump into the Linux stuff? So now we have a little benchmark, so now when we actually start um, writing our 
I/O scheduler, we can kind of like know what the application is doing when we actually see our I/O at the scheduler level. Any questions? Okay, so let's go write a Linux module. Uh, exit that. Okay, so I have a nice little hello world module here. Uh, so, so I mean, this is a little bit different than what you're probably used to seeing, but it's not nothing crazy. I mean, it's just C code. Um, so instead of like say C print F, that you have an XV6. In Linux, you just have print K, like a kernel print. So we have some hello worlds here. Um, there's also some C annotations so that we can tell. So this is a loadable module, right? We need to let it know that uh, when we load this module, uh, these are the functions that need to run. So we can do some setup or teardown. And then at the end, we are also kind of like pointing to that and saying, when you initialize this module, you should run this thing. And when you exit, you need to do this other thing. Right, so we have that. And let me pull up the make file. So this is kind of an unusual make file. It's not, probably not what you're expecting. And that's because that make is calling another make file, right? Where is that make file? Well, this dash C specifies where the other make file is, and that's in this kernel directory, which we had here, right? So this is basically, I mean, this basically comes out to like the, the name of the Linux installation I have, and this is where all those modules live. So I'm saying, go, go do my make from that directory but I'm still like pointing to the current directory, right? So like you don't see like all the normal kind of like dependencies and stuff in here, right? All I'm specifying is that I want to build hello.o, which comes from hello.c up here, and then these other make files are going to do that. So I haven't even looked at those, but it's just know that it's doing something reasonable, but it's hidden from you, okay? So I'm going to do a make. Okay, that's good. And what do I get? I get a .ko file. And so that's a module that then we can insert into the kernel. So if we want to see which modules are currently being used by the kernel, we can use not ls, which is for files, but lsmod for ls modules. And if we run that, we see all these different modules here that are running. And you can see how many different other modules are using them. And so what we want to do now is we can run an insert module command and we can insert hello.ko, okay? And then remember, this is going to do the print case, it's going to print, print our hello world. And of course, that doesn't work because we don't, haven't done sudo. So I'm going to do sudo insert that. All right, so we inserted it, so nothing happens. Where did our print k go? Well, all the print k's go to kind of an internal buffer that we can dump with this dmessage command. So I run dmessage and I see, sure enough, I got a hello world. Um, these, uh, so this, this D message will only show like the last, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 lines or whatever. If you want to see everything, uh, it's under var log kern log, and you see lots of things here, so I mean this is much longer. Um, I had a friend the other day who was trying to like get his uh, Linux box set up, and he was having driver problems, and we looked in here, and we saw, oh great, the, the driver was basically panicking, and like that was why his graphics were bad so um, so I mean even if even if you aren't doing kernel hacking like this this log file here is sometimes a useful place to have look if you're having um, hardware issues on Linux okay so we have that uh, let me run LS mod again and I'll just look at the beginning of it and we see that this hello module um, is inserted but nobody's really using it which is not surprising um, so let's we can also remove it the KO, ah, pseudo, and then sure enough, we say good, it says goodbye when it goes away. Okay, so that's basically how you can write kernel modules. Uh, any questions so far before we actually look at, um, at some actual real kernel modules? Okay, so uh, basically what we're going to do is, first I'm going to show you some stuff in the Linux like the main, the main kernel itself, and then we're gonna copy a scheduler out of there and then tweak it for our purposes, right? It's easier to copy and tweak than write something from scratch. So under here, mm. okay, so there's lots of files here, but what I'm interested in are these three files here, These all these files that say something, iosched.c, and let me, let me show you what those are. So. So 
I'm catting this file that's uh, a long path here. Uh, but it's like the system thinks this is actually a fake file. This is not something somebody actually wrote to. But I can read and write to this thing to kind of uh, configure the kernel how I want it or see how it's currently configured. And what this is telling me is that SDC, my, my third SATA desk, it has a scheduler. And each scheduler has a different policy. And the three, the three schedulers that are installed on this Linux machine are called Noop, NOAH, so that basically doesn't do anything. Everything it gets, it just sends directly to the kernel. It has a deadline scheduler and CFQ. And you see that deadline here is in brackets, right? So that's my current scheduler I'm running. Okay? So if I look back here now again, so I had my LS. So I see, okay, here, here were these three, three different schedulers I could be running. And I'm like, oh, look, here's the three source files for them. It's a little obnoxious. You have to name the files just the same way, right? But you can see the CFQ is CFQ, and deadline is deadline, and so on. Um, so, I mean, another thing I can do if I want, so right now you see it's running deadline. Uh, I can't, in addition to just catting this file or reading it, I could echo something else to it. So, like, let's say I want to start using the CFQ scheduler. I could just echo that and dump it to that file, which, of course, is permission denied again. Here's another thing that might annoy you at some point if I do sudo. Um, this actually doesn't work because the sudo only applies to the echo CFQ. So we do that with high permission, but then we try to write to this file with low permission. Uh, so it's kind of a bad design, but kind of the way you can get around that is I can do sudo to the shell command and that, uh, 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 and then I can basically run, run a shell. I can tell shell to run this command and do that with high priority. So if I do that, then it'll change. And then if I go cat back uh, the scheduler again, I see, okay, great, I changed to CFQ. All right, so our goal here now is to A, make our module and insert it so that shows up on this list, B, switch to it, and then C, run our benchmark and actually see that it's doing something different than the default ones. Okay, so so let me show you a scheduler, right? So the, the easiest one, some of these are pretty ugly. Um, this no op one is not very ugly because it's not really doing anything. So let me, where do I want to start here? Uh, so first let me talk about the scheduling framework a bit. So if I, if I come down here near the bottom, you see that I have this weird, uh, weird C code here. And let me show you where this is referring to. Include Linux elevator. Okay, so this is this is also this is just a header file. You see that there's all these type defs on different functions, right? These are a bunch of function pointers, and they're they're all type defs, so they just have a friendly name. And then down here, I have this structure called elevator ops, which contains all these different function pointers. And that's what this this is doing right here, right? We're creating our own elevator ops structure that has all these different function pointers and we're making them point to our functions, right? So the merge is going to be the noop merge, the dispatch is going to be the noop dispatch. Right, so th that's, how, that's how they make this pluggable, right? When I insert the code, right, it copies all the code into like executable pages in the kernel and then it gives somebody else this structure so now they know where our functions are living and they can call us, right? So that's something we're going to have to do when we make our own, we're going to have to like uh, use all these. So there's a lot of different things this is doing. The important ones, there's just really two important ones that you need to know about, and that is uh, add and dispatch. So what is what is add doing here? It's just adding this list add tail. Basically it has a queue and it's adding uh, this request, our queue, onto this queue. Okay. Then when we do dispatch up here, well, we don't do anything if the list is empty, if the queue is empty. But otherwise, uh, we're just grabbing the first item off the queue and then deleting that from the queue. And then this weird elevator dispatch sort, basically, that just sends it right to the desk. I don't know why they called it that. but um, so, so this is pretty straightforward. right? So this adds to the queue and this dispatches from the queue. So what, what policy is this, actually? This is a policy we talked about in class. What's that? 
Yeah, it's FIFO or, or maybe like, uh, I mean, FIFO is you generally think of for uh, cash policy, uh, but I mean, this is kind of like the equivalent. Well, what's another name for it? Just, I, I guess like, what? So, I mean, for a schedule, you'd probably just call it first come, first serve. I mean, yeah, FIFO is a funny name. Okay, so uh, this is just doing uh, first come, first serve. So we can change this to do something different, right? And then the other thing that's going on here is that you see that each of these, like they, they take a, this request queue, and then they're from that request queue, uh, they're basically getting this, this loop data. Basically, we can, when this elevator is initialized, we'll create an instance of this structure, and then that gets passed to all our functions, right? So we can do all our bookkeeping in this one structure, right? And the nice thing about this framework is they do all the locking before they call any of these functions, so we don't have to do any locking in here. Okay, so, so far so good. Uh, okay, so let's, to get started, let's copy, let's copy this, uh, this file somewhere else, and then we're gonna modify that to make our own, our own scheduler. So I'm gonna just call, call it C scan IO sketch, and we have to call it that, unfortunately. Um, okay. All right, so we have our new our new module now, and let me quickly. So I mean, everything says in here noop. I'm going to change that so it says C scan, the circular scan. Uh, oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to. Uh, I want to replace noop with C scan. Okay, so that's good, and I uh, will leave that name there for for now. Um, Okay, so now we basically have our own newly named module that's basically the same thing as NOOP. And now I have to modify the make file so it actually builds this thing, uh, which is called cscan-ioschedge. Okay, and let's actually, let's just make a small change now so that uh, we can see it's actually doing something. So when we dispatch here, I'll just say that we, well actually, let's, um, what do I want to do here? Let's actually print off the sector numbers as they come by, right? That would be a small change. So I may actually write a separate function to get the sector number. And to do that, I want to get that for an individual request. Okay, and the thing that can kind of get me here is don't don't worry about this too much, uh, but but sometimes like I might get a request that's not actually to data. It might be something like a flush disk or something. Um, so if I get something like that, I just I'm just going to return zero because I don't really care. Uh, but normally what I can return is I can return the actual sector number. Okay, don't worry about what that is all doing too much yet. But okay, so we've chosen a request here to run, and let's print that out. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, and then we'll just say get set, and our queue is the one we're choosing to run. Okay, so we'll make that. Oh no. Okay, yeah, I, th I thought I typed that before. Okay. So I need an LD because it's a long. Okay, so now I'm going to insert. This time I have the cscan.ko. And let's see that actually got inserted. Okay, so it's inserted, but nobody's using it yet, used by zero. But I can do this echo now. And for disk C, I'm going to tell it to use my, well actually no, let's before we even do that, let's see what our options are. Okay, so we saw, saw so far so good, right? We, in addition to noop uh, deadline and CFQ, we now have C-scan here, so we can switch to C-scan, uh, just like I did before. So I'll do that, and then I have to do the sudo, so sh 
dash C and then put the command in quotes. And let me sure, make sure it actually switched. Okay, so great. Now we're running C scan on that desk. And let me run LSMod again. And this is also a good sign. We see that it's being used by one other component in the Linux kernel, right? So that's that's good. Let me see if I do D message. Okay, we also see that IO scheduler C scan is registered. So now we can run our benchmark. That's way too small. And where were we? We were under here. So we have our multi-threaded benchmark. I'm just gonna go back quick and yeah, one thread is probably a good good for starting. All right, so I'm gonna run our benchmark that we wrote earlier. Ah. Okay, okay, so that's running, and now I'm gonna run D message, and I see, okay, great, and the kernel, I'm actually seeing this looks random, right? So that's that's a good sign, right? Because we're running a random benchmark, and we can actually um, show now that that ends up as looking random at desk, so no surprise there. So what do we wanna do next? We want to convert this to the C-scan policy, right? So for the C-scan, remember that we just keep doing a sweep from low addresses to large addresses, and when there's no more bigger addresses to go, we go back to the low address, right? So we keep, we can get fairly sequential I.O. patterns right, right, but we aren't really starving anybody at the high end or low end of the disk's address space, right? So any questions so far about what we're trying to do about or what we've done so far? Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, modify our C scan. So the first thing, right, so since we're doing the sweep, we kind of have to keep track of where our current position is, right, because we want to do the smallest address that's greater than our current position. So I'm going to add a position variable to the C scan data, and where do I have to initialize that? Well, let me just do that quick. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, actually, where do they do that? Yeah, okay, here. So position equals zero. So I'm just trying to initialize that to zero when we're initializing the queue. So that's fine. Okay, so we have our bookkeeping. And let me go down to the dispatch, right? So right now, we're basically popping the very first thing off the queue. What we want to do instead is we want to pop the thing off the queue that is smallest but greater than position. Right, so... I think there's going to be a couple functions we have to write for that. First, well, let's write uh, part of this one, and then we'll come back. And so we basically want to re end up returning, oops, we want to end up returning one of these requests. Uh, I'll say choose our queue. And we should probably give it access to the queue so that we can actually, actually find, like, look at everything that we're interested in. And let me make sure I get this right. I want to make sure I don't type anything wrong because if, it, if I do, then it actually crashes and it takes several minutes to reboot. Uh, okay, so this is, this is actually kind of a weird thing in Linux, uh, but they have a really ugly macro that basically works like a for each loop, right? So this is a macro I'm typing. And what do I want to do in there? So I, I want to loop over every possible request. And the way I do that is kind of, don't, don't worry about it too much because I don't want to explain the macro right now. Uh, but basically this is a for each loop over every request in the queue. And we're going to have to like consider each and then ultimately I want to return the best one. And the best one is just the smallest address that's after the position. So and when I'm done, I return best. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to say if this request, well actually we have the get sector. If that is greater than or equal to the current position, And if the best is null, or, 
or this one's smaller than that. So if this sector is smaller than the best sector, then we want to say that the best equals us. All right, so we're basically searching through the list for the best one. Okay, and then after that, we want to update our position variable so that it equals the best sector. Or the, the, the basically like the next sector would be a better word. All right, so this is so, so, so good so far, but uh, uh, what we aren't, don't ever do is, right, like this, this position can only ever increase, right? We never do a sweep back again to small addresses. So, I mean, maybe there's a more elegant way to do this. Uh, but what I'm basically going to do is I'm going like, to write a new function that says if the, uh, if, if kind of like the largest, if the largest address is smaller than the current position, then I'll reset the position to zero, right? So I'm going to say something here, and then I'm going to say position equals zero. And so what function, I'm going to make a new function that says uh, max sector and of all of these. So if that is less than the position, right, then I have to reset. Right, because we would, this, this loop down here would never find it otherwise. Okay, so now I just have to write this max sector function, which I'll do up here. And sectors are long, so sect, and I still need that. And to get this, I may have to loop over everything again, so let me grab some of this code down here. Oops, this is entry. Change that in both places. <clears throat> okay, so we're looping over all of these things, and I'll say that I don't need this anymore. <clears throat> I'll, I'll start that off at zero, and I'm, I'm basically going to say that uh, if get sector of that request is greater than or equal to max, then max equals that. And then in the end, I'm going to return that. No, actually, that's not a pointer, right? So, so that's good. So that's just the biggest sector, which will let us determine if we need to reset. Uh, and why don't you look at that code, and I'm going to double check it against my notes quick, just to make sure that we don't crash and have to waste time. Okay, so I think that function's good. Let me check this quick. This is an investment. Otherwise, I mean, it, it, this virtual machine reboots so slowly. Does anybody see any problems, or should we give it a try? Yeah. Would you want to do if max sex is less than or equal to the position? Like, wouldn't they be the same, and then you're still going to be stuck there? Um, well... As long as it's greater than or equal to down here, like I could, I consider running it. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. I, I think I think we could do that, but yeah, like as long as it's consistent. So either way, but yeah, I think it should be fine. Any other questions? Okay. So let's actually try running this. Let's see if it even builds. And no, it doesn't. So there must be a mistake. Uh, so twenty eight has a mistake. Hmm. Oh, what is that? What's a struct long? And more mistakes. I don't know how it looked the same as my notes, but in my notes compiled earlier. But uh, get oh, this is get sector. Uh, not we changed this. Oh, lots of mistakes. Okay. Uh, again, okay. And then is defined but not used. Okay, so that's just a warning. Let me. I think we might be good now. Uh, 
Okay, so, so yeah, so we wrote all our function for choosing the right request, but we actually haven't called that yet. So let's go back here now, and we currently say request equals, so right, this is our dispatch function, and we're just like currently popping the current thing off the list. We don't want to do that anymore. Instead, we want to say that this equals the choose request of the ND, okay? And as you remember, the ND report points to the queue, so that's how we were able to get it. So let's see if this compiles. What? Oh, okay. Good call. Wait, where? Oh, I'm down here. Oh, no. Why does that matter? Oh, yeah, well, that's actually a good, good thing it taught that. This needs to be null, right? Because we check if it's null later. Okay, any other mistakes before I actually run this thing? Okay. Uh, is it currently running? Uh, well, yeah, it's currently inserted, right? So if I tried to remove it right now, it would complain to me. So I'll just, I'll try that. And it says, oh, it's in use. So to make sure it's not in use, I have to switch to a different um, I.O. scheduler. I mean, you always need to have some I.O. scheduler there. So I'm going to switch that, and then I see that's not in use, and I can actually remove it. Okay, and it's gone. Okay, so I've built it, and I'm going to insert the new version now. And then I'm going to switch to it by echoing uh, C scan to my scheduler. Okay, and let me take a look here. So it's registered. Somebody's using it. So let's first actually see if this thing works. Well, I guess it'll be hard to see if it works because we don't have any extra debug output. Uh, actually, let me, well, let, yeah, let's just try it for a small thing first and see what happens. Oh no. Oh, is it still running? And it's dying. Dang it. That sucks. I must have done something stupid wrong. Okay, but I guess uh, I have to kill it and we have to reboot. So now would be a good time for questions. Uh. So that'll take a while. So any questions so far? About the projects or anything? The worst part is that now we're having to have to like debug it too, right? So. How did the memory contest go? I haven't seen the results yet, so. How many people put a lot of time into it? Oh no. <laughs> wow, well, it doesn't look like there will be a lot of competition. Did you put some time into it? You know, I don't, instead of like debugging this live, right, because who knows, I mean, if that takes 15 minutes, that will suck for everybody. I'm just trying to copy my code that was working and then hope it still works and then like kind of try to save the demo, so. Oh yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't insert them until you manually do them. I mean, there's like some file that you can set up where it will like insert all those each time, but otherwise I just have to do it each time. So yeah, thank goodness. Otherwise, this would really yeah. It's scary doing like storage stuff, right? Because I mean, if you mess up, then you lose your data, right? I should use Docker. What it? Okay. Don't listen to him. <laughs> okay, so let me. 
<laughs> okay, and I'm going to go to my version that was working right before I came here. And let me at least bring this up and show you that I didn't do anything drastically different. <laughs> um, so I have the same max sector, get sector, uh, choose request. It's resetting. So basically this is a little bit different because I have a bunch of uh, extra print case stuff. Um, in particular, when I'm looping over for choose request, when I'm loop looping over all the requests, I print what the sector is, and then I'm also uh, I'm printing a star by it if it's greater than the current position. Right? So I print the position, all the sectors, starring the sectors that are greater than the current position, and then I say which one I choose. Okay? And then for dispatch, I'm just uh, calling choose, and I thought that's what we did before, but let's let's try this code instead. Uh, Okay, so it's registered, and somebody's using it, so good. Let's see if this works. Okay, so that's a good sign. It didn't crash this time. So let's run dmessage and see what that looks like. Okay, so this looks more promising. So you can see, okay, so I print, I'm printing off the what the what the position number is. And well, in this case, it can basically choose any of them, and it chooses this 4166, uh, which at a quick scan is that the smallest one. Yep, that's the smallest one, right? So that's good. And then it's choosing one right after that. And so maybe this is a more interesting one. Some of these are smaller. Is this is this the smallest one here? Yeah, it's the smallest one. So you can see that see that it works, right? And I wanted to do some performance stuff, but I was like the performance numbers weren't really making sense since it's in virtual box. I mean, I think we could get more reasonable numbers if we were running on a raw disk, but um, you can at least see from the printfs that it that it seems to be working. So I think that is, is all I have. So I mean, that's a fun place to start uh, messing around in the Linux kernel if you want to get into that. So any questions? All right, thank you.